this edition of Ultrasound. Critics laughed back at the dawn of the 70s, but an unformed army of working class headbangers knew immediately that they were witnessing the birth of an explosive new musical phenomenon. They called it heavy metal. The music that Black Sabbath pioneered later refueled the revved up new British metal of the 1980s and added awesome crunch to the so-called alternative rock of the early 90s. Today, 28 years after the band first exploded out of the gritty industrial town of Birmingham, England, Sabbath still rules. We're a people band, you know. We always have been. Ultrasound turns back the hands of time to explore why, even now, fans and fellow musicians alike all hail Black Sabbath. In the summer of 1997, U.S. concertgoers had any number of multi-band package tours to choose from. But the box office champ that season was the metal extravaganza called the OzFest, founded by and starring the legendary Ozzy Osbourne. The second generation Children of Oz not only filled all the seats at OzFest gigs, they rounded out the bill too. Young musicians proud and dazzled to be sharing a stage with the most celebrated metal frontman of them all. For the four of us in Biohazard, if, if Ozzy hadn't done what he's done in his career and his life, and, and you know, the same goes for Black Sabbath and all that stuff, we wouldn't be doing it the way we do it now. Heavy metal, a scientific term whose first pop outcropping was in the surreal work of writer William S. Burroughs, was in retrospect an ideal description of the ear-splitting monster riff guitar music slammed together by four young scufflers in the grim British Midlands. And as unlikely as it might have seemed at the time, today echoes of that humongous sound as deployed by the original Sabbath lineup of drummer Bill Ward, bassist Geezer Butler, guitarist Tony Iommi, and of course the Ozman himself, can be heard all over the place. They're not just playing heavy for heavy sake, it's all really in the grooves and things. Black Sabbath being the originator, all hell Black Sabbath. When all the Seattle bands started like rediscovering stuff that happened before punk rock, which was Deep Purple and Black Sabbath, there was something that somebody had written in, in some magazine about how Black Sabbath were sort of the other counterpart to the Velvet Underground as far as like what was sort of influencing punk rock and post-punk rock kind of people playing music. Our story begins back in 1969 with four frankly penniless English kids, all newly arrived in their 20s, trying desperately to find a place for themselves in the hippie-infested music scene of the day. They tried playing blues and even jazz, sort of, and they'd failed miserably. And the twee, middle-class, psychedelic chart pop of the time didn't really resonate all that much in the industrial sinkhole of their native Birmingham. We were four poor working class people. Nobody was singing lyrics or making music for our kind of people. It was more for middle class people that could buy records. I mean, in those days, it was, you know, mm. flower power, hippies, bells, and for us guys in Birmingham, England, which is a dreary, dismal, polluted shit all of a city, you know, in those days. I mean, you know, where San Francisco, where, you know, that's like, a, like you might as well say, let's go to Mars, you know. Everybody else is singing about love and hippies and all that kind of thing. And all we were seeing was like people being beaten up in the streets, the Vietnam War going on, all that kind of stuff. The area where we came from was very rough, you know, there's good gangs and it was like a the environment was, and, and, and all the stuff came out in the music, what we, what we were seeing and what we were going through. At the time, Ozzy and the boys, perhaps infected a bit by the inescapable hippie ethos of the moment, were calling their little group Earth. But then they had, like, an idea. Tony said, we were talking one morning, Tony says, isn't it strange that people like to pay money to get 
you know, see scary movies. Why don't we write scary songs? Indeed, why not? So they wrote The Wizard and Wicked World, and the song that finally gave them their name, its title lifted from a 1963 horror movie by director Mario Bava called Black Sabbath. Oh, no, no, please, God, help me. It's an old Italian horror film, and I've always liked the title, Black Sabbath, and the first song we wrote was really doomy and everything, so just come up with this title, Black Sabbath. And it just took its own route, you know. We didn't, it wasn't planned. We just, we just liked what we were doing and, and the sound developed with the way we were writing the songs. Chris and Black Sabbath next managed to score a record deal, a pitiful one, of course, worth about $1,000. With this, they secured 12 hours of four-track studio time and recorded their first album, which changed the world in a way, theirs at least. Just to make an album, we were all like chuffed about making an album, and then the managers at the time said, your album's entered the charts in England at like number 17 or something. I mean, wow, and then all of a sudden I said, it's taken off in America, and we were like, we couldn't believe it. With this right out of the box success came fame and fortune, and they were ready for the fame part, you bet. Fortune, however, proved a trickier concept. There was another thing, we, we didn't start out to be business, when we wanted to be rock and roll players, you know, so when you get success, you get all the bloodsuckers in the world jump on you, and promise you this and of course you see you're very vulnerable at that age you know, you know if someone gives you a, a thousand pounds or something or a thousand dollars you think wow i've never seen a thousand dollars well all, all this we were thinking of was was the music side of it we loved yeah, yeah, what yeah. we were doing and we loved we wanted to get gigs you know and that was it we didn't we never thought about oh we wanted to make an album but we didn't the financial side wasn't you know, we would have probably paid them to yeah, make an we album. We would have done, wouldn't we? We would have paid them to make an album as long as that's how, that's how it was then. The first Black Sabbath album contained only the seeds of the sound that would one day conquer the head-banging world. Even today, though, nearly 30 years later, it can still rattle walls. I used to cry when my older brother, Corey, would play <laughs> Black Sabbath. I used to cry. <laughs> no! The album covers were scary, you know, everything about them was so... Yeah, the first, the first Black Sabbath has, you know, a faded picture, and you know, you look at it, and you're like, ah, I'm gonna burn it now. But you know, it's after I grew up a little bit, I stopped crying and start started learning. We tried to experiment, you know, all kinds of different things, but we never would sit, stick to any one formula. We wouldn't go like verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, solo, verse, chorus, out. We'd go all over the place. U.S. radio back in the early 70s, knee-deep in weedy singer-songwriters, had no use for Black Sabbath. The band got over purely on word of mouth and accidental discovery, such as that experienced one day by a very young Kurt Cobain while opening a shipment of LPs from his father's record club. He didn't even open them up. He didn't even open up half the records that came, and they were just sitting there, you know, in the plastic steel. And one day I opened them all up, and there was some great music, you know. Finally, I got to hear Black Sabbath, you know, the harder stuff that they wouldn't have played in Aberdeen or on the radio in Montesano or in Aberdeen, you know. So I, I, I was just like, you know, instantly a rock and roll fan, you know, a harder rock and roll fan. I was a big Van Halen fan. I didn't know anything about Black Sabbath at <laughs> the time, you know, and all my friends that were digging on Van Halen go, you need to check this out, man, War Pigs, and put it on, and it just, it ripped. It was awesome. You know, you're kind of cooking along, listening to rock and stuff, you know, as a kid, taking in what you're hearing from whatever source, and, uh, and then somebody says, hey, man, come check this out, and they put on Sabbath. And then, wow. Just a few months after making their debut, Sabbath released their second album, Paranoid, a classic of the metal form, bristling with anthems such as Iron Man, War Pigs, and of course the title track. 
This was the record that, for many musicians who followed, lifted Black Sabbath to the apex of the heavy metal heavens for all time. Sabbath's role in the genre of metal is that they were the originators. To me and to everybody that I know, they are the originators of heavy metal. Hey, that's pretty nice, huh? Well, no. I hate it. Because you've just got, it's got, it's got absolutely not one musical connotation in the word heavy metal, and it's also stigmatized. Not everything that we have done, both together and individually, uh, has been heavy metal. And there wasn't even any such term when we started. It's hard, bro. Years later. Oh, and I, would, I could much, I would much prefer to be called a hard rock band yeah. than a heavy metal. Because heavy metal goes from Motley Crue, Poison, Mo Motorhead. In, in, in the 80s, anybody that had a, a, had a singer, bass player, guitar player, and drummer was called heavy metal. Not every early Sabbath track was a turbocharged metal assault. Like Led Zeppelin, the band also noodled around with acoustic interludes. But by now, heavy metal seems the only accurate assessment of the Sabbath sound. It's aggressive. It's emotional music. and It's got a lot of all kinds of different things in it. it to describe it in a word, I can't do that. So I'll take a couple of minutes to say I think it, it's just it, it, uncompromising. Um, it attacks like hell when it wants to. But it wasn't all dark music. It wasn't all dark it sounds. I mean, there was a lot... We try to experiment in you know, all kinds of different things, but we never would sit, stick to any one formula. We wouldn't go like verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, solo, verse, chorus, out. We'd go all over the place, you know. Some of the time, it's only, it's only after the fact now, sometimes I'll carry you with them and I go, man, what were we on, man, you know? When people say metal or heavy metal, they think of, you know, upside down crosses and everything, and even Black Sabbath at one point became part of that cliche, but if you actually go back to where their music started and the progression of their music, it was, a diff it was about something very different. They really were an alternative band of their time. Ah, the devil worship thing. For the record, nobody in Black Sabbath has ever bowed down to Lucifer. But they knew cool imagery when it popped into their heads, and hey, they wrote a few devilish songs, okay? Get over it. Your world was made for you. People judge a book by the cover. In the 70s, we were doing a lot of songs about environmental issues, about world peace, wars, and all kinds of different things. The people only saw Black Sabbath, hear the bell on the first album and the thunder and lightning. That, that was it. That's all they wanted to hear. We made a conscious effort to get away from that, but the people would pull us back. But with a name like Black Sabbath, it's like the, the Beach Boys doing a satanic song. You just wouldn't buy it, you know? <laughs> Boys' reference is interesting because anyone who caught the Sabs live couldn't help noting how, well, sunny they seemed, how much fun they were having. As you can see here, five years into their career, they presided over a virtual smile fest at a monster music bash called California Jam. Like, was really real on stage um, <clears throat> and believable. And there was a connection, there was a contact point between us and the audience, where whether it was mutual anger or just mutual feelings or mutual, uh, you know, the same ideas and things that we were playing, or, you know, what, was, what, what I was singing about.
Black Sabbath hurtled through the 1970s at maximum volume, of course, and trailing a jet stream of classic rock and roll excess. You get the cars, you get the houses, you go, the, you, you know, you hear about other bands doing this and getting crazy, so you try it. You, know, you want to try everything. The groupies, the, you know, the, you know, the cars, the, the private airplanes, the, you know, the... It's what, what, what everybody's dream is, you know. What they went for especially were drugs and drink, and in such quantities that there are actually whole albums that Ozzy today can't even remember recording. By 1979, he was such a mess after 10 years of excess that his fellow Sabs booted him out of the band. I think the first two or three albums were written without any drugs or booze or anything. I mean, the first one, because we couldn't afford any drugs anyway. But it's not, I think by the time we got to Volume 4, which we... Volume, we, four, was it, well, volume 4 was originally called Snowblind, but they said, uh-uh, no way, Joe. Because that's when we found that magic marching powder, we, we thought, which was... It was like, it was like the devil in disguise, because, uh, you know, we, we, I, I ended up mega paranoid on that stuff. Well, we started off with a, as a rock band playing and messing with drugs, and we ended up being a drug band messing with rock, you know. And, and, it, and it's kind of like, that is it, you know, I mean, we, 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 we couldn't function, I, I couldn't function without getting up in the morning, getting out about 18 cans of beer down with, and cocaine and everything. And you, you, you're in, you, you, so you don't want to blame yourself, so you blame everything and everyone else around you because it's not your fault because you don't want to, but you don't, you don't want to look in the mirror and go, look, Ozzy, you're an alcoholic, drug addict wreck, and you, you, and you can't do it anymore. So you blame Bill or Tony or Geezer or whoever it might who's ever there. It's never you, you know. <laughs> Still screwed up, Ozzy nevertheless launched a successful solo career, selling millions of albums and ultimately inaugurating his own package tour, the Ozfest, which he headlined. Along the way, he famously bit the head off a bat, lost a talented young guitarist and collaborator, Randy Rhodes, and struggled to keep his family together through binge-fueled outbursts of domestic violence. As for his old bandmates, they kept the Sabbath franchise going with a series of alternate singers. All of them interesting, maybe, but none a true replacement for the original. For years, Ozzy and the rest of Sabbath barely spoke. But then, at an Ozfest date in 1997, they reunited to play a few tunes, and it felt good. So they officially reunited for a full concert in their old hometown of Birmingham, and that old Black Sabbath magic, amazingly, was still there. I think, you know, doing those shows in Birmingham shocked a lot of people. Shocked me, I tell it you. It shocked right? us all because we went out and, you know, the band has got such a unique sound, you know, that when we all play together. And I think a lot of people forgot that, even ourselves. And the, the amount of people that come up afterwards in the business it were just totally blown away with it. Shrewdly, the band taped its Birmingham reunion show for a live album, which will also include two newly written songs, Psycho Man and Selling My Soul. So it's official, Sabbath is back. And after all the years of bad blood, they say they're all friends again, too. Well, we all said a lot of bad things about each other, but to me, what I can say is water under the bridge. I mean, I mean it's, it's like everybody, everybody kind of ticks off with everybody else. I was gonna say pissed off, but I didn't, thought we were gonna tell you. <laughs> but no, it's kind of, it's, it's a natural thing, but I'm, 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 what I'm really glad, for, more than anything else, is that we're all friendly again, you know? And there's no, uh, whatever, whatever happened yesterday, I can't help, you know, but all, all I can do is get on with today, you know? It's, it's life's too short, you know? But yeah, all right. Not really a laughing matter, as it's turned out. During rehearsals for a pay-per-view TV concert, drummer Bill Ward suffered a mild heart attack and had to be hospitalized and replaced for a European tour by drummer Vinnie Apice. But Ward will be back for U.S. dates in the fall, rejoining his old friends to bask in the mainstream adulation that's finally come their way after 28 long years. It was just that magical, magical thing that happens when the chemistry uh, makes something just so striking and, and, and something so so new that, that it just uh, remains an important kind of touchstone 
to uh, to music. I often cite the first time I heard Black Sabbath as literally my musical epiphany moment. I was eight years old and I wasn't supposed to be playing my uncle's stereo. I had the Black Sabbath album, put it on, and it changed my life. I'm mystified that the I'm, I'm not, uh, that we're still in demand, you know, it's just incredible. We love what we do, and it's great to know that after all these years, you know, finally people have caught on to it. We're a people's band, you know. We always have been.